<laughs> Excuse me. Hello, testing. Oh, zoomed in too much. <sighs> All right. What's up? I don't know if I'm supposed to refer to my guests as Glassman Boppers or TYSO Goblins. I feel like I'm paying two mortgages over here. I, I don't know. I'll tell you this much. My energy right now, you know what this is? This is intro energy. This doesn't have to be this hard. Nothing does. You know, it's an interesting realization when you're in the thick of something and you're stressed and you're anxious about it. And then you realize, who gives a fuck? Why am I paying for a therapist? Why don't I just set up a camera and have somebody edit it and tell me to keep in the stuff that I need to work on? Oh, you veya smear. Excuse me. I guess I'll just get into it and introduce Nick. But I, I don't want to introduce Nick. I feel like I'm I'm on stage at a show and I just bombed and now it's my turn to bring up the next comic. All right, welcome Nick Swartzen. And then everyone's like, what the fuck? And then Nick walks up like, dude, what's with that intro? I want good energy. If you guys are wondering who I'm talking to, it's my Roomba. Carl. Talking is easy. Having something to say, that's the challenge. Whether it be nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows. No, but didn't that sound like it was a thing? For I stand corrected, but I sit with flaw. Not a moment passes by when I obey the law of dignity, of passion, of righteousness, of fact. Ooh. Imagine if the weatherman goes on and talks, points to some of the cloud and one of those blue things that have the triangles on it and then goes, you know what? I, I, I don't know. I just don't feel like doing this right now. The people at home would be like, geez, there's a storm coming, all right, and it's this guy's career. But here I am on a podcast not doing the weather. Maybe I should just do the weather. Maybe I should start off by doing the weather. Let me try that. What a weird job, doing something that a Google search could do. I guess Google, you could Google search jokes, but there's something lost that's lost when, when the robot goes, what has two legs and three arms, a table saw, or, you know, whatever the joke would be. What's a good joke? What's... A good joke. Thousands of our most funny jokes. Whoever did the SEO on this, I want to work for my podcast. How did this come up first? RD.com? Really? An elderly farmer had an old bull that lost its usual desire and no longer went near the cows. Hmm. The farmer called the vet who prescribed a pill to stimulate and then pushed to read more to stimulate the bull's interest. Oh, you vey. This, I Google searched the best joke. And the first website that came up and the first joke on it is this. Meanwhile, I'm literally getting f***ed in the ass. I can't say that, can I? An elderly farmer had an old bull that lost its usual desire and no longer went near the cows. The farmer called the vet who prescribed a pill to stimulate the bull's interest. A few weeks later, the farmer ran into a friend who asked, Hey, how's the bull? Great, said the farmer. The bull is back to his former frisky self. That's fantastic. What miracle drug did the vet prescribe? I don't know, said the farmer, but it tastes like li licorice. What? What the fuck? Is that the joke? Is it that the joke? He's saying that he ate the pill? That's the, the first, the top of Google, the top website, and the top joke was, I don't know, but it tastes like licorice? Oh! Please allow me to introduce your next comedian, Nick Swartzen. You may recognize him from Grandma's Boy. Jack and Jill, that's my boy, Reno 911. Blocks and Gary? Blades of Glory. <laughs> <laughs> Blocks and Gary. Blades of Glory. And he has a new movie coming out in March, Buddy Games. My introduction to Nick Swartzen was in 2009 with his Comedy Central special, Seriously Who Farted. I saw that special, it blew my mind. Ever since then, I've been a huge fan of his. We talk about this on the podcast a bit, but a lot of people know Nick from all of his Sandler movies and movies with Spade and, and all the other comedies he'd done, but they didn't even know he did stand-up, which is like his original craft. It's an interesting story we get into. I'm excited for you guys to hear it. He started doing stand-up at 19, blew up very fast, and then I, I'm sitting having this conversation with me. He's such a smart aware, nice, professional guy. Not saying that I didn't think he was beforehand, but I was I was surprised at how like, and I don't know what that means. I, I don't know why I feel that way, but I was just, is that gross? I just picked a fingernail and threw it. I th there's on a tray. I got a tray on the floor. This is something about throwing. Like a fingernail is gross when it's not on the body. Like a booger is gross in the body. A booger is gross when you flick it. But a fingernail starts fine. 
You want tickles with a fingernail. But the moment it leaves your finger, oh, oh, I guess that's true with anything. I guess an ear that's not on your head would be disgusting. Which reminds me of an old joke I used to like. My wife keeps telling everyone that she can read their minds, but she never can. She's telepathic. What? What? What the fuck? What do you call a lazy baby kangaroo? A pooch potato. Okay. If the comedy store and the laugh factory think I'm too weird to perform at their clubs, yet Reader's Digest is opening with pooch potato, I think I need to change my craft. You know what? No, I'm not going to change my craft. I'm going to continue to be self-indulgent, overly communicative, with bursts of fun energy. That's my wheelhouse. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you click that button right here, then click the bell, okay? Leave some comments. Let me know what gets you going, whether it's sexual fetishes or if it's something that inspires you to go back to school. But those are the main two. Starting Monday, the 23rd, I have a very special week coming up. I'm doing eight nights of Tyso. Each night, I'm going to have a different guest for a mini episode. I'm going to be live streaming them with YouTube Premiere. So if you guys know about Premiere or into Premiere, I'm going to be watching them live with you. We could comment, talk to each other. I haven't done that before, but I'm excited about trying it out. And I feel like this is a special way of doing it. It's for the holidays, man. We start Monday the 23rd for eight nights in a row. I really want people to check it out. And I guess all I could say from here is scoot doo bubbity blue. I had a thought. Yeah. With Hanukkah, they thought the candle was only going to burn for one night, correct? Yeah. And it burned for eight. Right. So when you started this, you didn't know how long it was going to be, but now it's burning for and growing just like Hanukkah. And that's why it's so special that you're doing these mini episodes just like in Hanukkah. I, that kind of had, what do you think of that, that thought? I'm sorry, I have my headphones on. What were you saying? <laughs> Understand, you're the, you'd be the fourth guest in a row that isn't using them. Everybody used them. All of a sudden, people are stopped using them. Like, there's something I don't know about cans. And they all refer to them as cans, like they're showing off. <laughs> all right. Yeah, dog. Hello. I'm sorry, a lot of times people think I'm testing my microphone. I was talking to you. Hello. Do you like to look up when you talk or down or straight? Um, I'll do like halfway like this. Does that work or is that no. in my face too much? Yeah, I was making a joke and then I realized how would you know that I was kidding. It's got to be under dude. Otherwise okay, yeah. I mean, you can move it wherever you want. No, this works. I just don't want you to cover your face. Oh, yeah. Gorgeous face. Scoot doo. Blabbity blue. Scoot dee. Do you think you have a gorgeous face? Are you confident with with, with I'm with, confident. I don't know if my face is gorgeous. What's the, what are you most confident about in your physical appearance? I think my my height and my eyes. How tall are you? 611. <laughs> um <laughs> like 58 and a half. It's funny like people will argue with me <laughs> when I would be like I'm like 59. They're like no fucking way. And I'm like all right, I'm like five eight and a half. They're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Sorry, I was off a little. <laughs> Do you think that they feel that you are inflating yourself as a lie? As I think to so. Easier? Like I had some like agenda. I'm Pe not going into the comedy draft where I need to be like a certain height. <laughs> people, people do. If they're going around the height, they always round up. Until they maybe right. get to a certain point where they're insecure about being too tall. Yeah, I have friends that are like too tall. So they, if they were a half, they would round down? Yeah, they would round down. As At what as number as do you think you round down? I mean, I think if you're not in sports, mm. I think you round down probably about 6'6". Six, six. So 6'6 six, six and a half is 6'6". Six, 6'5 six. Six, and a half is 6'6". Six, six. I think 6'5 and a half is 6'5". So you start rounding down at 6'5 six, six, and a half? Yeah. 6'4 and a half is what? 6'4 and a half is 4'6". They round way down. 
Okay, you heard it here first. <laughs> six, six and a half is six, six. Six, five and a half is six, five. And six, four and a half is something funny that I don't remember the number to. Four, six. <laughs> Nick, you came over here. Um, you're supposed to be here at noon. I don't know if this is for sure, but I'm pretty confident that you were the earliest guest to ever get here at only 15 minutes early. Comics are like really bad at uh, being on time. I've noticed in my 23 years of doing comedy. 23 um, years today? Uh, no, February 12th. It'll be 24 years. Okay. Um, no, I, I just, it's like we were, t- we've talked about OCDs before and tardiness is one that I, it just drives me insane. So it's like, I would rather be early than late. Like, I just can't stand when people are late. It fucking drives me nuts. What, what is that, how does that touch you on your obsessive compulsive disorder? I mean, I guess it's not really... I mean, it is an OCD, but it's just... Is OCD for you to be on time? For you to be early? It's OCD for not so much me to be on time, but if people are late. Like, I fucking... I have things where... Like, if I'm going to a movie and it starts at 8, I want to get there at 7.50... Or 745. Like, I can't... I have a problem if, A, the movie started or the trailers have already started, I'll, prob- I'll probably leave. Even if the movie's only two minutes in, I'll just leave and I, won't see it. I won't see it if, the, if I'm late for the movie. But I will, although I like the previews. If I'm late for the previews, I'll stay for the movie. I'll, I'm 50-50 on that. I, I could So you've it. gone to a movie. You got there before the movie started during the previews and said, I'm out. I've done... I've, ra- that's rare. But I have pulled that card. Do you think there was something to the fact that maybe you didn't want to be there anyway? You didn't see want- that could be a part of it. And usually, when it's that case, it's one of my movies. Really? Oh, sorry. No. Let me get rid of him. So, <laughs> no, uh, on the video podcast, uh, uh, that's a fun visual gag, an FVG. Yeah. But if if people are listening to it and they don't see it, they're missing out on one of. The funniest visual gags I've ever seen. Yeah, that was a great gag. But I mean, that's their fault. You know what I mean? Dude. So yeah, OCDs we were talking about. I mean, one of my big ones, my number one is elevators. It's fucking horrifying to me. And that one I, I rarely waver on. I like I had a really bad fear of flying, which is common. That's not really that weird. Well, you can't you just go past elevators. I know. I'm going to... They both are tie in together. Oh, you... Oh. So I'm doing like a, like a side thing that, and then I'll come back to elevators. A lot of times people do their side things in a parenthetical voice. They go... Elevators I'm most scared of. I mean, no, airplanes. I was... You know, like there was no... I'm coming back to elevators. Yeah, I'm not fucking Dalia or what? fucking Brian Callen. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm fucking... Um. Well, now it seems like you're very much like them. Yeah, now I, I just morphed into them. Uh, so yeah, planes because of claustrophobia is a big tie-in. So planes, I had um, a big problem with, and it started when I was, I was hung over on the road, shocker, and everything was fine with planes. And then I did a commuter flight from Minnesota to Michigan. With like the propellers. It was like a tiny plane, not like you know a fucking mail plane from like the fifties, but it was like. <laughs> It was just like a small plane. Okay. And I was hung over as shit. And I get on this small plane and I'm sweating and stuff. And I had a chair next to me open. And I'm like, oh, this is fine. And then this giant human, it was like out of a movie, just walked. They were like, oh, we got one more. And the plane was full. And then this guy starts lumbering down the aisle. How tall would you say he is? He is a large man, very Midwest. Um, he's probably six feet, about 400 pounds. So that means he could be six, one. You could be any six feet. You can go anywhere. Okay. I mean, he could be and he's fat. a hologram. Yeah. So he sat next to me and then like kind of pushed like his body just kind of pushed me against the window. Mm. And then, <laughs> then I, uh, the plane started taxiing and I started to panic and I stood up in the aisle. Well, I walked over the guy stood up in the aisle and the steward like, you have to sit down. And I'm like, I can't. I'm just, and she's like, sit. So I sat down and then, I started to talk to the guy and we kept taxiing and then I just started screaming and then I like fucking, not comedy screaming not comedy screaming like you having a panic attack I was like ah, ah, stop the flight stop the flight and everyone's like oh my god you gotta be fucking kidding me and they had a taxi back the stewardess runs over it's like are you sure and I'm like I have to get off this fucking plane and so they had a taxi back, get me off. You could tell they were all business people. This was in the middle of the day, so they probably had to make their commuter flight. And I just stopped the whole thing. And I'm walking down the aisle, and I could just hear people mumbling like, 
what a fucking asshole. And I was just like, felt really bad. But then that mind fucked me for years and years because I would revert back to that anytime I got panicky. And so I've stopped revert back to that, that feeling. feeling of like panic. So I've stopped like probably four or five planes since then, but now I'm fine. Yeah, I've put, I, I've like barfed on myself on the plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had some. Do we have any footage of that? <laughs> no, but I did. Um, I did panic and throw up on myself, and then uh, I stopped the plane, and then they got me out. Were you always on the window during those panics? Um, the window kind of would trigger it. Right. So, do you try to go aisle now? Um, now I can do whatever with a little magic called Xanax. <laughs> That's an amazing pill, isn't it? It's pretty great. But I, I don't, like, my doctor would give me it. Your kinesiologist I, I or it. your actual doctor? No, my actual doctor. And uh, a lot of the times, I mean, most of the time, I don't even take it. Just knowing I have it, just in my right. mind, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm fine. And also, if I have a show that night, I'm not going to fucking show up in, like, a Xanax zombie. There's something about knowing that you have the tools in your bag that makes you not need to access it yeah totally i never take it i mean it's do you ever go up on stage with a drink even a water yeah i always do yeah when i don't have a water on stage i sometimes will like and i need i feel like i need a water yeah but when i do have a water on stage a lot of times i will never even use it yeah no just knowing it's there i mean i usually use it though well you've been doing it longer than me i've been doing it 48 years today yeah Really? Yeah. It's amazing. Today. Um, but yeah, so like, what, yeah, water. I mean, I used to have a cocktail. I don't drink anymore, but I used to have a cocktail on stage. And you said you're sober sober now, which means there's yeah. different stages of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was a big drinker, um, but I was also like this juxtaposition of like he, big drinker and I would smoke when I drank. Smoke what? Chain smoke. Uh, cigarettes. And then I would detox and not drink for like four months. Right. So it was it was like all or nothing. When did you start drinking? How old were you? I started drinking when I was probably 14. I don't want to be boring with this, and I say this because I know some people don't like being interviewed, but can I ask you a couple of just quick questions of origin stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't know this information. I don't know if I should have... You don't uh, know my origin story? I don't know your origin story. I don't know... Hmm. I, I know you're... Uh, I, assu I always assumed you're East Coast Boston, but I don't know if that's real. No, I'm Midwest. Minnesota. Minnesota. Um, I think I just figured that because of all the Sandler stuff. Right. Um, so you're from Minnesota. Are you an only child? Uh, no, older brother, older sister. And you are... Or what, do they get, what do they get into? Are they in the arts at all? They're homeless. Both of them? Yeah, I made sure of that. What do you mean? You you made a point to make sure mm -hmm. that they had beautiful lives and I I um I ravaged them. How old were you when this happened? I was fourteen. I took a sip of beer and then just started throwing Molotov cocktails. So the first time you started <laughs> drinking at fourteen and they're what, sixteen and seventeen? Yeah. Got them the fuck out of the house, man. And I became a huge star. When was the last time you talked to either of them? Like two minutes ago. Which one? My older brother. You mean like right before you got here? Yeah. What did you get? Was that the first time you spoke in a while? I was just making sure he was still fucking homeless. He called me from a police police department. I had him arrested. In Minnesota? Mm-hmm. What did you have him arrested for? He wasn't wearing a jacket and it was cold out. And they, the police listened to you they walk as you're a star or something? They fucking beat him. Yeah. <clears throat> so back to my real origin story, which is tantamount to Boba Fett. Um, yeah, I'm from the Midwest. I have an older brother, older sister. They are, my brother's a singer, songwriter, bartender in Minneapolis. And my sister is, she's like, uh, she's got three kids that are great. And, um, she kind of does, uh, consultant work. Um, how would you, I don't know how you describe it. I have family she's, members that I can't describe. Um, can't? <laughs> Jesus no. Christ. Uh, no, she's really cool. Um, she, oh, like, okay. she right. creates right, like cool. products for, um, companies and stuff like bath products. She's like really so it's very creative. And they're both in the hometown? Yeah, they're both there. So you're an uncle to three kids. Yeah, they're really cool. Um you just say, it seems like you're saying everybody's just really cool. Like are you worried they're gonna hear this? There's none of no, them. No, they aren't won't. Cool? They have no idea what podcasts are. But uh no they are. I, I wouldn't say that if they weren't. But uh I don't know. They're they're like really You were closer to your brother and sister. Yeah, we're close. So you're 14, you start drinking. Maybe your brother or sister was drinking first and introduced oh, you to it? Oh, they partied, yeah. Good God. 
Yeah, we were, I mean, like, kind of tornadoes. I was the worst. I was definitely, my sister was pretty bad, but I was bad. Was your OCD bad as a kid? It wasn't. I still, I had the elevator thing even back then. Yeah, no, t- tell, me, tell me what that was. That's the same thing, claustrophobia, doors close. It's just, if the, if the elevator stops, like, that's my biggest fear, is if it stops, like, I don't know how long I'm going to be in there, so I'm very controlling about that, so, like, anybody would be. But I mean, so you're you're doing rituals when you're getting on the elevator. If I get on an elevator, it's a fucking miracle. I mean, some cases like New York, Vegas are two where you kind of can't get away from that mm-hmm. because there's so much security and so much, you know, in New York, if I have an interview or I have a meeting on the 54th floor or 40th floor or whatever, you know, I'm not going to fucking do, take do you, When you go with press for things, do they know yeah. this about you? You tell them. I tell them, but it's, you know, I mean, I'll even show up 45 minutes early if it's like 30 flights and I'll take it. Tell me how you would tell somebody that, listen, I don't want to take the elevator. How do you word it to them? I would go, what's up, bitch? I'm not taking the fucking elevator, dog. Well, I, I ask sincerely because I have so many, th- so many things mm-hmm. that I have to find ways of communicating them either by making a joke out of it or by over communicating i've learned as i've gotten older only in the past few years how much of my personality and my always being on was in a way so i could communicate things that felt weird or uncomfortable right so like when you're in a professional setting and i i don't even like talking about them much but if i go if i come in a door i want to come out that door which isn't a problem but sometimes you come in a door you go around and there's another exit they go out those exits i have to say i'll meet you i'm going to go around this exit and it's weird right so like does that matter? What if it's a new relationship with a professional person? I'm wondering if there's any any way you navigate that being a comedian. Well, I feel like we kind of... First of all, people think I'm joking when I say the elevator thing. So it's like... I totally I'll, understand. I'll be like, yeah, what, where's the stairs? And they're like, um, yeah. So yeah, the elevator's blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. no, where are the stairs? And it's funny that I get into shit with... I had a meeting at some company, um, and it was only four floors, and the security guard was such a fucking bitch. And I was like, I need to take the stairs. She's like, we don't have stairs. And I go, every building has stairs. And she's like, I- I'm in at, and it's like snowballed her fucking brain for like 20 minutes. And I called the company. I'm like, I've got to take the stairs. They came down. It was so easy. They found the stairwell. Mm-hmm. There was no locks or anything. So that's super annoying. But a lot of people think I'm joking. And, you know, I'm like, no, I'm not. And then I take the stairs. But it's it's never that much of an issue they usually have a story about somebody else they're like oh yeah so-and-so has to take the stairs so you're I did, probably a so-and-so story for stairs for some people now yeah i've become a legend in the stairwells in the, in the stair community yeah but i did jimmy kimmel uh one time and uh i was going to hair and makeup and they're like here's the elevator and i'm like i can't take elevators and they go you're joking i'm like no can we take stairs and they're like yeah and they're like ray liotta is on before you the guest and uh he had the same thing. He couldn't take uh, the elevators. So I'm like, no way. So Ray goes on. Then I go on after him, and Ray stays out there. So it's a commercial break. And I turn to Leota, who is like, he was cool, but he, you know, he, he was Ray Leota. <laughs> and uh, so I turn to him, and I go, hey, Ray. And he's like, yeah, what's up? And I go, dude, I just, not to bother you, but I, I'm afraid of elevators, too. And they said, you are, and I, I have to take the stairs. And he goes, no way. Yeah, they fucking suck. <laughs> and we just had this moment of bonding. And he just fully turned to me and he's like, have you ever been stuck in one? And I was like, uh, yeah. He goes, fucking off. He goes, yeah, fuck. Me too. He goes, I was doing Saturday Night Live and I got stuck in the elevator at uh, 30 Rock. And he's like, we were stuck for like 15 minutes. And um, we bonded over that. So that always made me feel better. That story makes me think of uh, an entourage when uh, they bring out drama, when Vinny brings out drama mm-hmm. because of this behind the scenes stuff. That's some behind the scenes stuff, but it never made it to air. You never said when you came back from commercial, Ray Liotta and I don't take stairs. Do you ever regret that moment and why? Go. No, because I, I just, if Ray Liotta somehow got mad at that or didn't want people to know that, yeah. then I would probably be shot on the couch. <laughs> there would be yeah. like. I, that's just somebody I, you know, like he's yeah. a really good dude. He's just and he's intense, so I wouldn't want to make that guy angry. So you're 14, you start drinking, and are you funny? I was always funny because it was just like a mode of survival. I was really small, so I was kind of the runt 
of my friends and in school. I mean, not like cartoonishly small, but how small. tall were you? Five, eight and a half? Like when, when, when you were like, in high school? No, I was like five two. In high school? I got up to like five five. But like freshman year, I was probably five two, five three. Okay. And then uh And are you insecure about that? I wasn't really that insecure, no. I mean no, I wasn't that insecure. But my sense of humor got me. Th- I went to like inner city schools that are really tough. And I was just always goofy and cracking jokes. So I remember I found one of my old yearbooks when I graduated grade school, my sixth grade yearbook. And all the comments from my classmates were like, you're going to be a comedian someday. You're so funny. And the comedian was spelled wrong, which made me laugh. But it was, uh, it was, it was literally 90% of the signatures and comments were that I was going to be a comedian someday, which is kind of funny. There's a specific kind of funny that you have that is like so goofy but intense also right does that connect does that make sense what i'm what i'm saying yeah um and those are something those are two things that normally they're not mutually exclusive but it's normally not those at the same time right i don't know if there's a a pattern for people that do have that or not but it does seem like that intensity thing comes from a different place than the silliness thing yeah. And I, I mean, I could ask more specific questions, I guess, but if that resonates with you at all, do you connect any of that to, like, if you were bullied or if you came from, uh, if you were, came from a, a place where you needed to assert yourself a certain way, I could see that. But it seems like you were a little kid, you, uh, you had older siblings that probably took charge. Where does the intensity come from? I mean, they didn't really take charge. They were kind of indifferent. I mean, my sister and brother were like five, six older, five years older than me. So they kind of left. And then when I was in junior high, they were gone. My brother was at college and my sister moved to Florida. Are your parents together? They divorced uh, when I was 13 going on 14, which is a perfect age. Right when your brother and sister leave. (laughs) Yeah, my brother and sister leave. Then my mom grabs me in the middle of the day and she's like, we're leaving. So she gets her brothers to move us, and oh, it was like a, it was like a fucking out of a movie. Why like a was really it, boring? Why Hallmark was it movie so quick? Was there was there an incident? She just wanted out, and she just didn't want to drag it out. So she found she left our home and found an apartment. We just how long after your brother your brother your sister's the oldest. My brother's the oldest. Your brother's the oldest. So how long after your sister leaves does this happen? Uh, six months. So she was almost waiting for it to just be you two. I mean, I guess I don't know. My sister left pretty impromptu, but it, I don't think it had anything had anything to time out with that. Did you notice that things were going on with your mom and your dad? Oh yeah, it was a shit show. Okay. I, I mean, they were just arguing, and it was just it was pretty toxic. Did you maintain a relationship with your dad when you? Yeah, your mom left? yeah, we were still close, and you know, it's just hard. I mean, for people, you know, I'm sure they've grown up in this scenario where it's just, you know, mom and dads where they just would kind of not make you pick a side, but. Yeah. sway you you know what i mean yeah. where it's like you know your mom's like crazy i'm like what and my mom's like you know your dad's like a fucking asshole psycho i'm like oh, what so you know did I just, you know did you know were you able to separate parents from humans at that point did you know why they were saying what they were saying or did i they- i was kind of hip to it and then uh my dad made this mistake and for anybody listening who's a dad that's either going through this or <laughs> might go through this he kind of made the mistake of like, of like just being my friend. So he wanted to like befriend me and be like cool, you know, which was fine. But then I had nobody like reprimanding me. So that's when I just went to shit. Could you, could, could you tell me what, what more specifically about what your dad being your friend, what that cannibalized? What if he was more of a father figure or more strict, I guess you're saying? Well, I grew up with like being like afraid of him. Like he would spank me. He would raise his voice. Like he had a really booming voice. So if I fucked up, like it was very jarring. Okay. And then I just watched that morph into, uh, you know, a guy that had just been kind of beaten down by life. I mean, he had filed for bankruptcy. He lost his job. He became a writer, really brilliant. But then he just became, he lived in a tiny apartment and wrote, you know, didn't make a lot of money. But he didn't care. He just lived the life he wanted. But he was so didn't want to lose me in any way. And I think I, he never admitted this, but f- you know, probably felt beneath 
everything or like our scenario my mom got a good job and we had a nice apartment and so i think he just wanted to be cool with me which he was and it was great but i had just to extend this like when i was 14 started drinking the wheels like really came off so i started selling drugs smoking pot doing any drug selling drugs like weed or more more weed pills mainly weed but i just went off the rails my friends were in gangs we were stealing cars Mm. i mean it was like i had to go to court ordered rehab when i was 16 right i got expelled from high school four times i mean it was like the wheels came off was he expelled from school because of bad things you're doing or hyper things you were doing it was just i was just crazy i mean not in a bad way but like i would pull fire alarms right to go smoke a cigarette i would I got busted smoking a blunt in school. Why would and I pulling a fire alarm help you smoke a cigarette? Because our doors were magnetically locked because the school was dangerous. So you figured if everybody goes outside, I could sneak away and smoke a cig. Well, there was only one. It's a huge school. There was only one door open um, with security and sometimes a cop. At wow, the, at and the this, one is in door. The, this is in the 90s. Yes, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Because now that's been happening with you know so many of the school shootings, but I don't remember being a kid and going to schools that were worried about that kind of stuff i guess i just it wasn't so much school shootings like it was just it was such an eclectic like group of student i mean it was a huge high school i mean this is early 90s and they had i mean so many gangs you know punk rock dudes they had a gay lesbian club glc I mean, it was really what it was the glc glc is that what it is Oh my God! Yeah, the GLC, and uh, edit that out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they had it was such a, a mix, and uh, it just shit would go down. I don't know. It was really bizarre, and there was a lot of racial tension because this is like during like Rodney King yeah. and OJ and stuff like that. And so just to be safe, I mean, they just had one door that wasn't locked out of this giant. School. And you're living with your mom in a nicer house, and you see your no, dad's weekends. Apartment. I would just he lived like right down the block, so I would just we, I would just see him whenever. He didn't pay child support or anything, so is he still around? No, he passed uh, ten years ago Thanksgiving. And you were you were he was in your life up through then. Yeah, he was great. He was really cool. So he's a he he was writing, and you said he was smart and creative. How did he feel about you deciding to get into comedy? He was totally he loved it. My mom was the one that was like trepidatious about it. She was kind of like what because of because of the 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 lack of security in it the lack of security i mean she's very old school i mean she grew up in the suburbs of minneapolis which were it was like quintessential uh you know she came from three kids nice house in the suburbs and you know you go to college and you get married and you have kids it's very cookie cutter so she just didn't couldn't process like what you want to do stand-up comedy like my grades got better after i had to go to rehab when i was 16 how long you rehab for is it like a month <clears throat> it was a week and it wasn't inpatient. So I just had to go to these classes and stuff. You were forced to? Yeah, I had no choice. I got arrested at school and handcuffed. And doing, for doing what? Smoking a blunt. <laughs> Which is Different frowned times. upon. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Were you so with I, friends? What? Were you with friends smoking it? Yeah. Did they all get arrested? Yeah, we all got p- pinched. That's the, that's a cool that's, term. Yeah, that's kind of how, that's how it is on the streets. Um, but yeah, so... You know, she just didn't see any security in it, but I couldn't really just go to any college. I mean, I, I had like, I got my GPA up to like a 2.8, which is not bad, but, you know. So when did you start doing stand-up? Right out of high school. And did you start and go, or did you dabble in it for a while? No, mm. I started and went. So I started theater in high school to get my grades up. Then an improv company came to my school, and we did that. I did improv, and then me and my buddy, his name is Colton Dunn. He's on the show Superstore now. Mm-hmm. And he was one of my best friends in high school. And we got moved up to the professional league in, for this improv company. And so we were in high school and we just started playing with these like adult improvisers. Were you good? Yeah, we were both really good. And um, then after high school, I didn't have the grades to go to college. My improv company folded for a minute. So I decided to go to an open mic and try stand up. And I did. And it went amazing my first time. And they were like, you got to come back. And then. A club maybe the house MC like a month later. So you did drama because this is an easy way to get my grades up. You didn't necessarily seek out that type of performance. No, I was like, I need a fucking A. And then my teacher, after like a month, was like, I was at the beginning class. And she goes, what is your deal? And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, you're good. And she goes, you've got to, 
you have something. So she moved me up to the intermediate class. And then, well, hold on. When she says you have something, you know, at, at a young age like that, when, when you're being reinforced and validated for something that is personal to you. Right. It, fe- it, it, tr- it uh, for me, it just fe- feels good. And, and you want to seek that, right? Yeah. It's just, I, I you really. You believed her. I believed her, but it also, it kind of filled in the rush of the drugs and stuff. So it How? was, well, it, it's fucking intense. Like, you know, being on stage, especially at a young age. You're saying you get the dopamine rush. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it was so intense. And we had to do these plays in the school where it was fucking, you know, it was like a hardcore school. I mean, they were quick to boo anybody. They would talk shit. I mean, it was... Really? Yeah, and so I remember I did this play, and I was so influenced by, like, Jim Carrey and all those guys at that mm-hmm. time. And I did a play, and other the other plays got booed, and people would throw stuff sometimes. And then we did our play, and I played this character of a teacher... And I did it so big. It was such like a Jim Carrey ripoff. But I just committed to it so hard. And the crowd was just roaring. And nobody booed or anything. They were just roaring, laughing. Mm. And I just completely took the stage over. And I walked off. And the theater teacher was like, holy fuck. <laughs> she was just like, I've never seen anybody do that. And you, you, you felt powerful? I felt like it was just a, such a crazy rush. And then I became addicted. Well, how old are you then? Are performing. you 16 then? But 16, yeah. Did you go home and you tell your mom, your dad? I don't think so. I didn't really, I wasn't somebody that's like, hey, check me out. Did you <laughs> get you, that? Did you get like that type of validation from your parents for stuff that you did? Um, yeah. Yeah, they were cool for sure. Yeah, my mom saw me in plays and, you know, she definitely. Before that, I mean, before you started doing theater. Um, yeah, yeah, they were always supportive and nice. Yeah, my mom was pretty incredible. They were both, they, yeah, they were both great. So then you come, and then you do your, your, your theater troupe, that goes under, you graduate high school, and you've gotten a taste of performing, and you want to do it, and you know it's comedy? I just, it became just a drug. The first time I opened yeah. mic and it crushed I me, mean, usually people have bomb stories, and mine just killed. And it was, I was just so frenetic and i didn't want to bomb and i was terrified of silence so i was just this spaz on stage for like three minutes yeah and it killed i mean minnesota is a polite way to a, a polite place to start and then are you it, drinking now you're you're 18 years old you went, um not not that i recall no i i kind of i dried out for a long time so when you went to rehab for that week you were off off the juice for a bit I was off everything. I quit cold turkey and um, drinking coffee. Not even. No, I was. I was never a coffee guy. I just quit all drugs and alcohol. Smoking. I didn't really smoke. No, I okay. quit everything. So you're doing comedy. You and getting, I just I just became obsessed with that, and I lost all my friends. So I had to make a whole new circle of friends. What does so that my, mean? Well, all my friends that I did drugs with either dropped out. Or they were just like, oh, Nick's not getting high anymore. Right. These are my friends, you know what I mean? It was kind of like... Did you feel that you weren't included now because you stopped something? Or was it just an organic disinterest? It was an organic, just like, oh, I just didn't want to get high anymore. Right. And I, you know, I couldn't. That's really mature and smart at that age to know to stay away from something like that. Yeah, I mean, I realized, yeah, I realized that it was just, I just saw my friends just one by one and uh go down and i was you know it bummed me out but i i luckily theater and acting took that place pretty quickly so i got to i got a fix from that and be, became friends with people that you know weren't into that you know when you started doing stand-up and then you're funny and you you want to get better is this like a career choice for you at the moment do you say this is what i want to do for a living i made that choice yeah because everything escalated quickly so i was lucky enough to what have does that mean well, I became the house MC, and then I started going on the road. I mean, this is all how long, my first year. How long year. from your... You started going on the road your first year? In the first year that I started, February uh, 12th, 1996, in my first year, I worked at one of the top clubs, became the house MC, started working the road, started opening for the big names that came into Minneapolis. Wow. Won a contest for HBO. Got the Aspen Comedy Festival. They picked me as one of the top young comics, top 25 in the country after six months. Signed with Three Arts. They flew to Minnesota and signed me. And then I was had two TV credits, NBC's Comedy Showcase and Comedy Central's Make Me Laugh. That's all in the first year. That's nuts. Yeah, that's insane. 
looking back at that, knowing what that is and where you were, do you feel like an anomaly? A hundred percent an anomaly. I mean, I was really lucky to have really good advice from people. What kind of advice? Why does that happen for you in year one? Because I was so green, but I was so strong on stage. How so? Energy wise? Just energy wise. And the club that I started at, they they made sure that I wrote a lot. And so I always tell young comedians, you know, for advice, I'm like, just write. Write like non fucking stop. So what does that mean? You're sitting at a desk with a pen and paper? No, just any idea you have, whether it's whatever it is. If you think it's funny, write it down. Even if the joke doesn't make sense or you can't figure it out. If it makes you laugh, like a premise or just something, just write it down. Do you write it in a pen, a pen and paper or on your phone? <laughs> Back in the day, I would have like a little notebook. Do you but have now, a, now I put it in my phone. Could you read me an example of something that you wrote down that you didn't expand on yet in your phone? Um, I shut my phone off. It'll take a minute. It's okay. Um, I, uh, I'll edit from here. Yeah. But, uh, well, no, I mean, my last Wait, special... Wait, hold on. I won't edit then. <laughs> my last special I did for Netflix was a joke, my closing bit was a joke that was just a one-liner I thought of at the Houston Laugh Stop, opening for David Cross, who I opened for for like five years. And it was just a throwaway joke. And I was with David, and I go, I just thought of this thing, like how funny would it be if you came as much as you peed? Like if you urinated (laughs) that much, come. And he just started laughing, and he goes, that's really funny. And he goes, you should just tell that on stage. And so I went on stage, and I was like... Yeah, so I just went to the bathroom. How cool would it be if you came as much as you peed? I'm like, that'd be so fun. And then I got like a laugh, and then I just I did it for like a month, and I threw it away. And I was going through an old notebook. This is 10, 12 years ago. And I came across it in a notebook, and I was like, oh, yeah, that was funny. And then I made it into a bit, and it became my closing bit on my Netflix special. And I acted it out. I did this whole thing. I mean, it's so dirty and whatever. But When did that special come out? It came out last January. What's it called? Um, it was Comics of the World. It was me and Dalia and Nicole Byer oh, and right. Neil Brennan. There, there, uh, there's four of us. We did half yeah, hours. Half hours. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to watch it. Comics of the World on Netflix. Um So you have an idea, you write it down, and that's not that's the, that's writing down an idea is different than writing out a bit. I, I I write down ideas and then I go on stage and I and I try them. I usually don't write down scripts. No, I just write a premise and then go from there. So when you say write, you mean write down your premises. Because you can't sit down and write no, down no, premises. No, no, no. I mean, I don't know many people that do that. But I mean, just write down your premises. Write down your ideas. I remember, <laughs> and I, I don't do this anymore, um, but when I used to drink, well, I mean, I, that was not that long ago, but I used to drink and drive, which is fucking awful. I mean, thank God we have Uber now. But back in the day, I was at the improv. I was probably 24 years old. And I was going to meet my friends at a bar that was right down from the improv. This is in Hollywood, California. And uh, I'm driving about 10 blocks. And I've had about six, seven vodkas. Jesus. And, which is nothing for me. And uh, I'm driving and I got music blaring out the window. And I pass a cop car. I'm going down side streets. The cop car passes me. And I'm like, they're going to fucking pull me over. I just knew it. Just knew it. So I t- look in my rearview mirror and they're doing a U-turn. So I floor it. Step on the gas, floor it to the next street, Make take a, a, right. a quick right, park it, jump out of the car. Uh-huh. They come out with lights on, jump out of their car, and they're like, what are you doing? Put your hands on the fucking hood, whatever. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> and they were like, empty your pockets. Are you on drugs? Are you drunk? And I was like, no. And they were like, what the fuck? So I'm emptying my pockets. And they're like, you have no drugs? I go, you can search me, search my car, no drugs. So they go, what are you doing? And I go, I'm just leaving the comedy club at the improv. I just got off stage. I go, I will not lie to you. I have had one cocktail because I get so nervous when I perform. It's so scary. So I have had one drink to just calm myself down. So that disarmed them. They were kind of like, oh, what's your, what? You're a comedian? And I'm like, yeah, I just got off stage. And they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I would need a drink if I had to fucking do that. And I'm like, yeah, it was just one. And they were like, um, all right, hey, what's that? And they point to my joke notebook. And I go, that's my notebook. It's got all my jokes and ideas. And so they start flipping through it. And they go, what's this? And I go, it's a joke. And they go, what's a joke? And I go, I have a cat. He has diarrhea. And, and the doctor's like, what have you been feeding him? And I'm like, diarrhea. <laughs> and they're like, all right, that works? And I'm like, yeah, it does all right. Wait, wait are these the traffic control or the comedy no, this, police? Yeah, no. These, so they keep going and they go, 
yeah all right i guess that's pretty funny they're like what's this <laughs> i'm like it's an idea i have for a movie and they're like what is it i'm like well it's about a guy blah blah blah, 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 blah. i give them that premise of the movie and they go yeah i could see that i could see that working that's probably that's a good idea what's this and they fucking just keep going <laughs> And then after like a couple more things, they go, they turn to each other. One of the guys goes, what do we do with this dude? And he goes, he's a fucking young comedian. Just let him go. And they're like, okay, don't get back in your fucking car and don't fucking drink and drive. And I was like, I won't, I swear. And they're like, all right, get the fuck out of here. So I'm like walking to the bar, shaking. My buddy's like, what's going on? And I told him the story, but that was one of my favorite moments. These cops just like, what? <laughs> all right i guess that's I guess so that's such enough. a los angeles cop thing to do like oh yeah i guess there's a there's, yeah there's a joke in there you know like but i'm not quite sure if it's do you have ready a treatment do you have a treatment for it <laughs> who are you meeting with uh so at 24 i gotta go back to it in the first year how you accomplished goals that people who have been doing this for a long time have never even done um, i was hated by yeah. other comedians yeah because when i was so young i was 19 and got all this success and then like a lot of local like road comics and stuff we're just so mad, dude. Yeah, I got a lot of shit. You know, the comedy community is 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 feels like uh, most of the time a very very supportive place. It's you know everyone is seeing people at their most vulnerable. We're all trying to do the same thing, and then when you start to when someone starts to get success, it becomes cool, and people are even more attracted to them. I have noticed, not necessarily speaking for myself, but just peers, that once some some people get to a level to where. I don't know if it's threatening to other people or it's just that they're they're jealous of it or whatever it is. People become mean about people. And it's not it's like behind their back. It's very high school. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you agree with that? And it feels very cliche. And you don't know how someone's gonna be until they become that thing. The person well, that gets it becomes successful or the person that never becomes successful, both of them change. Right. I mean, I find it. You know, people always ask me, like, who's an asshole? And I'm like, well, nobody's a real asshole, but... Right. I mean, I felt like the people that are really successful and have shit going on kind of live in their own world and aren't threatened by anybody. So it's more of, like, the people that are insecure coming up. And, but everyone's insecure. It's not I mean, just... there's a level of insecurity, but, I mean, guys, when I was coming up that were kind of road dogs that I've been doing it 15 years were like really bitter. I say the word like all the time, God. They were really bitter and just kind of backstabby mean. BSM. BSM. But also Do you think you know, the thing the thing that I did, which I because I was stone sober when I started. You gotta give me a timeline on the so sobriety thing. Okay. So <clears throat> you, you sixteen, I'm sober for probably the next three years after like sixteen. So three or four when I, was, when I moved to New York, I started drinking again because I so, turned 21. So, so 19 or 21? Because six that would be five years. I moved to New York. I just turned 21. Okay, and that's so you weren't drinking for the first then two... No, when I was 20. Sorry. So the first year and a half of stand-up, you're sober. Yes. You get a lot of success, a lot of attention. You have management from three arts that flew in. And now, why pick up the drinking? Are you doing more intense well, stuff? So there's a different definition of drinking. There's casual drinking, which I did. So I would have cocktails when I was in Aspen. I would have cocktails and stuff like that. And then there's drinking. Which happened when you go to New York. No, which which happened, which was like the last decade of my life. Oh, which really? Is like, so your first specials, you weren't? No, uh-uh. Yeah, we were talking about that when you first walked in. Um about the vibe, and, and I didn't remember that. I think you said you, you did talk about being sober. People thought you were a, a stoner or something? Well, yeah, people think that I do coke and smoke weed and all this stuff because I joke about it a lot. And yeah, and just that. But I never say that I do it, I just make jokes about it because it makes me laugh. This is unrelated, and it's something that I, 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 I was bringing up in the kitchen and I waited for the podcast. Um, your, your first uh, hour special, which one was it called? seriously who farted seriously who farted yeah so i mean i guess spoiler it's been out for a while but you're it's a closing bit about the the you killing yourself right after you you how does it i'm sorry to put you on the spot it was you farting or i don't think that was my closing bit but it was about i would never commit suicide but if i did i want to yell something really weird right before i did it just to fuck with all the people that witnessed it so I go in front of a group of people with a gun and be like, "Who fucking farted?" And then I blow my head off, <laughs> right? Just so everybody watch it, be like, "What? What did that guy just killed himself? The, what did you just say? Who farted? Who farted? Why the?" It was the silly it, that that's that's there's 
there's a Brian Regan was the first stand up album I ever listened to. Like yeah, the CD. Amazing. Um, and then the first special that I remember, other than seeing like clips of George Carlin and like stuff people would show me, but like first thing that I could remember of like putting it on and, and seeking it out was that's your special, that uh, special. Okay, yeah. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind because it's like it was. Uh, I said this to you in the kitchen, but it was it was a moment of how do you do that? Like how does somebody do what you did? Because yeah, farting and then doing this thing and other jokes that I don't remember, but I remember thinking like the words weren't inherently funny. It was uh, you were telling it this certain way, right? I don't know what my the point of the. I, I do know the point. I just kind of wanted to tell you that 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 special was. If it weren't for that special, I wouldn't. Be, I'd be in a ditch somewhere right now. Jesus! No, no, that's not true. But yeah, that's an amazing special for whoever's watching or listening to this. That um, I'm sure know Nick from wherever you know him from. But if you haven't seen, I mean, maybe plug your your new Netflix one too. But that special was a fucking powerhouse, bro. And it introduced me to you. And then when I saw you in all the movies and everything, I don't know. I just always knew, like, whenever you come on screen, whenever it was, this guy's the, one of the funniest fucking people. Oh, and cool. then that was my context. That was my introduction to you. Right. I think there's something powerful about knowing somebody stand up. And then when you see him and other stuff, it's like you it's like you know their superpower. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. Because, like, sometimes I'll see somebody, um, uh, I'll see somebody doing something and they're funny or whatever it is. And then I'll see their stand up. And if, if they're, if they're at a certain level, it's like everything else they've done. You start to appreciate the nuance and, and, and you see it differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, I watched Friends and Lisa Kudrow <laughs> was always, uh, have you seen her do stand up? It's incredible. No. No, I'm just joking. But I watched, oh. I watched Lisa Kudrow on Friends and I, it was always whatever to me. That character was always just very weird and whatever to me. And then when I saw the comeback and I saw what she's able to do. Oh, right. Then when I, when I watch Friends now, when I watch her, I'm just like, this woman's fucking brilliant. Yeah. You know what I mean? The comeback was great. So uh, really really the characters you play in a lot of the Sandler shit is the biggest, goofiest, wildest shit. And then I just feel like I'm watching someone do a brilliant performance. Like I'm giving you too much credit or I'm seeing it, whatever is like, like I'm seeing you like you're my kid or something. Right. But I watch you do these things and it's just, so I just want everyone to know your stand up too. Yeah, it's funny because when I was touring, I mean, I still tour. I got a big tour next year. And uh, a lot of people don't know that I do stand up. Yeah, I know that's that's fucking so, it's so, so bizarre. Weird. So when I would do shows, you know, everybody knows me from the guy from Grandma's Boy, Reno Nine One One, and then other movies. Those are the two biggest, and Benchwarmers and stuff like that. And now pronounce Chuck and Larry. Was and now pronounce Chuck and Larry you. and Zohan and all that. But you know, people are like, "Hey, man, I saw your show. Like, you're really funny, man. You're really good at stand up. Like, that was blown away." And I was like. Yeah, no, I do stand up. Yeah, that's your. And they're like, yeah, I know that. I know your movies. I never knew you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, I've done this for like over 20 years. Right. So it's, it always makes me laugh. Um, people don't know that Kevin James does stand up. Yeah. Or at least did. And I, I just for whatever reason, I saw his special probably before I saw anything else of his. The bit I just always remember is he had a, a bit where you give your phone number. Yeah. And there's a certain cadence, say. Mm -hmm. and it's like it's ba 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 ba, and he fucks around with that. People don't know he's done it. And it's just like people that aren't involved, like big comedy fans. And it's it's opened up more now because comedy's everywhere. But people don't, they don't know you until you've been in something. Right. And that thing that, that you or a person have been in is just like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I mean, good God. I mean, I'm going to tape my sixth special next year. Is that including the two half hours? Yeah. So I did two half hours, two hours, and then Netflix half, half hour, hour and now another hour. And then now another hour. When you tape it? I don't know yet. Probably in the fall. That's when my tour starts. But I do so I'm doing select dates in the spring just to get ready for it. But it's a lot of work. People don't realize that how hard it is to especially once you're established as a comic, to just keep maintaining a level where it's good, you know? Good for me. I mean, at least like I don't like just churning out just to do a special, but Eminem uh has referenced in one of his many songs some of his many songs, how he's the top, he's the best, and he came up with a perfect rhyme, and now he has to do it another hundred times. Right. Man. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's hard. And he's and hilarious. He is funny. He is funny. I like his relationship with Delia. So it's funny. wild, man. It's the craziest thing. Yeah, he's a king. 
Like he's one of the he's he's like Eminem's oh, like. Oh god, yeah. And then to see yeah, it's 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 wild. He I missed him. He came to Sandler's office, they're friends. And they like oh, played yeah. ba- they played basketball and then he signed a poster on the wall and it was a grandma's boy poster that he wasn't in. Um Sandler wasn't in it. No, I'm saying Eminem wasn't in it. Right. Eminem signed a poster that he's not in. Yeah, it was a grandma's boy movie poster and he wrote um like it was a line from Grandma's. So it was one of my lines. It was. Oh, cool. It wasn't your shit's week. It was maybe I can't believe you came on my mom, or something. <laughs> it was something like that. And he left, and then I showed up like 15 minutes later, and they're like, "Dude, you just missed Eminem." And I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> and I was so bummed. They showed me like the writing on the on the the signed poster and everything, and I was so fucking bummed out. And uh, then I tried to make up for it, so I was like doing shows in Detroit. I'm like. Adam, do you want to like text right. Marshall and see if he wants to come to the show? I just kept like, I was so sad and sad. So you were saying how much time you, you, it's spent for a special because people know you as this, and you you want you have to make sure you have to put out something that's as good or better. Yeah, which is really hard because I'm obviously every comic is their own cri- their best critic or hardest critic, and you know I don't know, and you try to evolve too, but I still have like new diarrhea and farting jokes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I try to have some stuff that's... Do you think you're funnier now than you used to feel like you were? I don't know. I mean, I don't critique that. I think that I'm a better actor, and I think I'm a better... I've grown definitely in a lot of ways, but Mm -hmm. I think my older stuff is really good. I think my new stuff is good. I, I just defer to the audience, you know? Once I start getting booed and not selling tickets, and I'll be like, "Ugh, sure, hang hang it up." <laughs> do you a little Buffalo Wild Wings to start fucking slanging? Do you love acting the same way you love stand up? No, I love stand up a lot. I mean, I love acting, and because it's quick and you can put yourself into a role, even though it's my roles are insane. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, stand up is great because it's all from your brain and it's immediate, and there's no producers, there's nobody telling you what to do. With movies, you have to deal with studios and people going like, ah, I don't think that works. Ah, that scene's not great. I don't know about that. And it just drives you insane. Dude, when you're working on Sandler stuff, do you have to do that? I feel like Sandler has carte blanche in kind of ma- making the decisions. I mean, he he does for the most part. But I mean, the major studios would have pushback. Netflix is great because they don't. They just trust the artist, which would, most people should do. Right. And it's insane that they don't. And you, we would be in note sessions where studios would be like i don't know this and this scene it's just not working for me and sandler would get you could just see it in his eyes be like you gotta be fucking kidding me and you know a lot of the networks and studios they they just give notes to validate their jobs just to like oh i should say something because i'm in the room so they'll just say something and it's you know it's very weird how'd you meet sandler he was a fan of my stand-up so he saw my first special on Comedy Central when he was in bed with his wife. How, wrote, what, how old are you when that first special came out? 23, 22 maybe, 22 or 23. And Jeez, you had a, your first special out in four years. Yeah. It's pretty insane. And then he wrote my name down. He walked in the office. He's like, who is this kid? And the younger people were like, oh, that's that Nick Swartzen dude. He's new. And he goes, I want to meet him. And are you in LA at this, or New York? I mean, I'm in LA. So you moved to New York at nineteen, at twenty one, and then you moved to L.A. I moved to New York at twenty because I turned twenty one in New York. So I moved there at twenty, and I would just turned twenty one when I moved, and then I moved to L.A. So I was in New York for a couple years. You shot your special in L.A. I shot my special in New York. In New York, then you moved to L.A. Then I moved to L.A. So Special's I got an agent. Out. Sandler sees you. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was in New York, and that was a big piece of advice where. After Aspen, Aspen Comedy Festival was huge. It was brought on by HBO. And this is back in the day when comedy festivals were could make make you like a multimillionaire. So Montreal and Aspen were two of the big ones. Just for laughs in Montreal. Just for laughs in Montreal. So you would go to these festivals and all these networks, all these studios, agents, everybody would go and they would see the new talent. They would see older talent. It's still really big. It's like still that. really big. But back in the 90s, it was fucking monstrous. Right. People were signing half million deals, I mean six figure deals left and right. Okay, I mean this is the time when s- sitcoms and TV were built around comics. Right, Seinfeld, Roseanne, Tim Allen, all these people, Paul Reiser, all these people had shows. Jeff Foxworthy, and they were huge shows. And so 
I didn't know what to do. And so everybody was like, don't move to LA right away. Move to New York because I was so young and so green. So they don't see you yet. Yeah. They were like, make LA and Hollywood your last destination. Make sure you have an hour of material that's strong and you have an idea of what you want to do. Because when I went to the comedy festival, these people were like, so what sitcom do you want? How do you see, what do you want to do? And I was like, eh, can I get the David Spade's autograph? Like I had no idea. <laughs> And so, like, I, I moved to New York, and I just cut my teeth there and bombed horribly and did well and just grew as a comedian. And that saved everything. If I moved to L.A., I wouldn't be on this podcast right now. You think that, right? You think that? it Was, was it because uh, the New York let you grind your teeth a certain way, or is it because you weren't, your first impression was better because you moved here later? I grinded my teeth... And like, could I, you have done that in LA? LA, as you know, isn't a place to grow as a stand-up. I mean, New York. Why? New York, there was, there was like eight or nine clubs. Because you could get up more in New York. You could get up more, and there was just so many different kinds of clubs. I got into the alternative scene, mm -hmm. started experimenting more on stage. I just started trying different stuff. Alternative rooms were not the comedy clubs. They were bars. They were coffee houses. And you felt were, more, more safe um, trying bigger bigger swings there because they're more receptive to that. Way that. more. Way more receptive. Comedy clubs, especially when you're new, you had to f kill. You had to do well so you could get back in there. Uh, if you bombed uh, and you were new, they'd be like, ow. Oh. Uh, I've been told um, and I've heard advice given to others that don't go to comedy clubs too soon in L.A., which is kind of what you were saying in New York, just – play smaller venues until you're ready and i think i've fallen into going to the comedy store uh the laugh factory when i was younger right and i know i still have a reputation of being just too weird even though i think i'm so funny now <laughs> and it still gets in the way from that really yeah that's why i'm just connecting with what you're saying about yeah had i just gone to new york for multiple reasons one more shows in in, in more di diverse type of rooms and two, not having people think, oh, Rick's just going to go up and fall, fall asleep on stage again. Like, I was just fucking around. Right. And yeah, you make a first impression. People don't remember. They just remember not funny or weird or whatever. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, you want to do well. I mean, even now, it's like I'm trying to work out new material. And they're like, all right, you have a spot at the store. It's you, Dalia, Whitney Cummings, Joe Rogan. Bobby Lee and Joey Diaz. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to try new material. I mean, I'll throw in like some stuff. Right. But it's like a Saturday night sold out. You know, you want to do good. So I've been doing open mics and like stuff like that, which I love. I go back to Minnesota. I'm going back for all December to just do open mics. There's that many open mics in Minnesota? Yeah. The comedy scene there is great. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The club I started, Acme Comedy Company, is one of the best yeah. in the country. It's insane. Yeah. I've played there. Yeah, I loved it. You didn't like it? Yeah, I just didn't. You say I'm not picturing that open mics all over hey, the place. I didn't know. I yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, that also, by the way, as much as I was playing, going back like this, that was very jarring to me in my headphones. <laughs> uh, it's fine. No, it's fine. Oh, yeah. Great acting. You Why are, are you getting bleeding out of your ear. Fuck, I thought you were joking. No, it's gone. But yeah, it was it bad. Okay? Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, it was just so loud. Yeah. I... So you're going back for. Open mics in Minnesota. <laughs> just, you know, putting Start. in putting in bad blood yeah, yeah, fake, yeah. you know, just it, I move but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um no, that was just a comedy edit. There was no blood. That's what you get on Take Your Shoes Off. We're gonna cut to a spot. You never know. Blue Chew. Guys, do you remember the days when you were always ready to go? I know I do. I used to have boners so big that they would that people were impressed by them. Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up. BlueChew.com. That's blue like the color blue. Did you know Blue Chew brings you the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis? <laughs> so you know it works. Girls, give me one sec. I'm finishing up this advertisement. Okay, but there's 10 of us. You think you can pleasure all of us? I don't think that'll be a problem. So you could take this anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. Oh, right, right, right. Since they're chewable, though, they do work twice as fast as a pill. So you'll be ready to go whenever the opportunity arises. I love the word arises because they're talking about a big old cock. It's guaranteed to make the girl have nine orgasms. Now, I, don't hold Blue Chew accountable to that. That is take your shoes off guarantee. 
Blue Chew is prescribed online and it ships straight to your door in a discreet package. So there's no in-person doctor visits. There's no waiting in the pharmacy. Sometimes you go up to the pharmacist who's got big jugs and you have to be like, oh, I, uh, I go soft in condoms. Not anymore, guy. Best of all, no more awkwardness. That one I can't guarantee. The whole thing, even with a big rock hard cock, still having sex is going to be awkward. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a little Jewish. They're made in the USA and since Blue Chew prepares and ships direct, they're cheaper than at a pharmacy. I have a special deal for my goblins. Visit Blue BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free when you use the special promo code SHOES. That's S-H-O-E-S. Just pay $5 for shipping. Again, that's Blue, B-L-U-E, Chew.com with promo code SHOES to try it free. Blue Chew is the better, cheaper, and faster choice, and we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. And we're back. So you're doing open mics in the- No! Now we're really back. Yeah, your acting's good, man. Yeah. Real good. One of the best. So you're going home to do open mics so you could try out stuff that you couldn't try out at the comedy store. Yeah. I mean, especially I've got two shows in Minnesota, December 27 and 28. So I just want to get ready for those. They're big, big shows. Why are they so big? I mean, it's they're two shows and it's 3,000 people per show sold out. I'm going to ask you how they went because this is going to be coming out in December after those shows. Oh, okay. So, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Then just edit that out. I'm going to, listen, my TYSO goblins know that they get the real down and dirty, unedited, <laughs> uncensored right here. So we're going to find out about it, and then you're going to let us know how it went. Okay. What does that mean? Because when you say that up on the screen, it'll be like, uh, Nick's first show was, you know, blah, 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 his second show. Maybe like you could, I'll text you, and you could... And I could put up the text message of you telling me how those end of November shows went. Oh, okay. So people get a little BTS. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. Is yeah, the behind accurate? the scenes. Yeah. So uh, since you don't want to try out stuff at all the clubs during the hot weekend nights, is there something that you have now that you could try out? That we oh, could no, see? I do. Like, I'll work in new material where I, normally I would do a set that's 80% new. If I'm doing a big show on Saturday, I'll do diarrhea. Nick, what I'm asking is, you have your phone, you turned it back on, you have some premises in there. Can I have you try a bit for the first time right here live on the TYSO stage? you need to spit that out? No. Um, let me see what I have. And also, would you like me to move the chair so you could actually stand so you know how this stuff works? No, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one... <laughs> all right. Let me see. This one's really dumb. Could you do it to camera? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one I just thought of the other day. I, I probably will never do this, but it made me laugh. I was looking at an Instagram post of my friend, and I just, it was a long caption, and I kind of ignored it. And I just po like picked up a couple buzzwords like fire, mixtape. So I was like, oh, my buddy's in the music business. So I posted an emoji of fire and then a heart. And then my buddy texted me, what the fuck's wrong with you? And then I went back and read the actual caption, and he said, um, I'm okay. My dog did die in the fire. I tried to get as much stuff out as I could, and I mixed up a lot of my old tapes, And uh, but I'll be back. And I had written a fire emoji with a heart that I loved fire, and he had his life turned upside down. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of a throwaway. I don't know. Maybe it's a tweet. I don't know anymore. <laughs> so that happened, and you put that in your notes. And what did you put in your notes? That might, like, how does that? How is that written exactly? It says, "Quit comedy, faggot." <laughs> oh come on, no. man! <laughs> it says, "Fire mixtape." No, my tapes got mixed up when my house was on fire. Emojis. So that's when you say right all the time, you're saying when things happen, literally write down those for you, your process, write down that sentence or those couple of sentences. I'll write down a couple of sentences. The worst when I was drinking is I would think of stuff and then write it. This happens a lot with comedians I've talked to. and uh, Happens when I'm high. Yeah, when you're high or you're and drunk you or you're just in a rush or something, and you'll just put like one word. And then I'll go through my notes where it says like new ideas. And I'm like, what the fuck? Um, I remember Mitch Hedberg had a similar thing about when he was sleeping and he would wake up in the middle of the night and write it something down. And uh, I'm not going to paraphrase Mitch Hedberg, but it was th that kind of idea where he's just pa groggy. You can paraphrase him. I would love to hear the story. I'm a huge fan of his. It's not a story. It's just 
it was just a, a similar premise of that, of just in a rush, writing something down, waking up and being like, what is this? Were you friends with him? I was friends with Mitch. That was a really hard loss. Yeah, wow. Mitch was one of the first people, um, when I started Minnesota, he was becoming a headliner out and not being an opening act anymore. And I remember seeing him on stage for the first time I saw him. And I was in the back of the room. And it was Mitch, and he just sauntered up on stage, long hair. And he would tell a joke. It was a packed crowd. And he would tell a joke, one-liner. And it would get a laugh. And then he would, he would wait 30, 40 seconds and then tell another one. And I was like, what is this guy doing? And I'd never seen anything like that. And he would tell another one-liner. And the audience would laugh. And he would just go back and take a sip of anything and... And I just couldn't believe how he didn't like care about the silence in between because I was that was always my biggest fear when I was starting out. And he would just didn't give a shit. I mean, he would just do his one liners and he would just kind of stand there. And that's when I realized the power of making the audience. I mean, they're waiting for you. You're in control. You're in charge. It's your stage. Mm -hmm. So they can say they can do whatever they want. But it's like you're the it's about you. Yeah. You know, you can take your time and now I'll take my time and not in a way where it's like, yeah, I'm going to take my time. It's just like having a breath, not just like you have to be like I was when I started. I was crazy. Right. You have to give them time also to breathe it in. Yeah. I sometimes I've when I, I've noticed in real life, but in stand up, it matters more. Shut up. <laughs> like, yeah, like slow down. Um, but Mitch Hedberg's tempo and pacing is, he's, that's, he's the only person that has that version of it. Yeah. It's very specific to him. And when you saw him do that, that changed your delivery? It didn't, that didn't change me. It just kind of opened my mind. I was like, oh, wow, that's, well, that's a different, that's different than anything I'd seen before. Was he like, he wasn't like that off stage the way he was on stage, I heard. Um, yes and no. I mean, Mitch was shy if he didn't know you but wasn't was that a character on stage the stoner voice i mean uh, yeah a tad i mean it, it wasn't it's not the same but i mean yeah he was still he wouldn't speak in that cadence all the time right. he would, you know he would talk but he was he was you know similar to how he was on stage but it wasn't mere image you met him he was he was doing it longer than you he was like yeah he had started i think Six years before me, maybe five. And we were friends ever since. I mean, I remember the last time I I saw him, we did a gig together. Chappelle had canceled a college in Florida, and they got me and Mitch to co-headline for a homecoming. And I hadn't seen him for a minute, and it was great. And we caught up and hung out. And he goes, hey, man, do, uh, do you want to get a drink? And I was like, yeah, for sure. I'm like, is there a bar around here on campus? And he goes... No, man. And he has a knapsack and just pulls out a bottle of Absolute. And um, I'm like, oh, well, we don't have any ice or mixers. He goes, no, nah, man, I got cups. And it was he just pulled out two red cups. And I was like, all right. So we just drank like hot vodka. It was like really gross. But I just did it anyway. And um, yeah, I opened and then he went on Why stage. Why did you do it anyway? Because you wanted a drink with him? Um, I just do that. I wanted a drink, and he was there, and he had. Vodka. We never, we never got the timeline, and that's my fault. You started so twenty one. You you said it wasn't until the past ten years that you were drinking heavy. I mean, I always drank on and off, but I didn't. I don't drink Why sober when, now. Because well, first of all, I don't drink when I film, and you know, I just because you've why? well, I don't want to. I mean, usually I produce a lot of what I do, and that means I have to be there every day. Right, and call times are six seven in the morning. So, A, you don't want to be on camera hungover. Right. Especially the older you get, the more you look like shit, especially on camera. So, I just stopped drinking when I was filming. I Did never... you learn this? Were you mentored for this kind of stuff? You're always on time. You want to make sure you could do your, your job before you do the other stuff. I wasn't really mentored for it. It was just trial by error. Mm -hmm. So, I remember I was doing Chuck and Larry, and I was fine and didn't really drink. And then uh, there was one night I didn't think I was uh, working the next day. I thought it was just... Mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of a filler day where they were just picking up shots that they didn't need me. And uh, my buddy was like, I think you're working tomorrow. We're not drinking that night to a Comedy Central party. And I'm like, I don't think I am. And he's like, no, I think you are. 
and I showed up. Not only were they filming and they needed me, I was on camera and I was like, fuck. Mm. And so I ran into wardrobe and I was just like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And then I saw myself on camera. Yes. What um, was it? It's, it's a courtroom scene in Chuck and Larry. And I don't look, you can only tell because I can tell. But if you I know, could visualize that scene right now. Yeah, I could, I could just see it, but nobody <laughs> else would maybe notice that. And anyway, so I just decided not to. It's just not worth it. Yeah. And then, uh, so I mean, I, I've drank on and off for years and years. So it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like drinking where the last like decade I would just be like, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to fucking drink. And I would drink, I mean, I would drink a lot. I mean, when, you, when you're touring and you have the life of a comedian and you've got time off, stuff like that. Do you tour with just, a friend? I have opening acts that I, are friends of mine. But but you don't feel alone on the road is what I'm no, asking. No, 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 never. I mean, and I'm one of those like drinkers where I just love drinking. I never needed it. It wasn't, you know, I can be at a bar sober. I don't panic or anything. I, I just love to go out. I mean, people, I've drank with crowds. I would go out afterwards. I would fucking do whatever. I would. I You're was, in t touch with your body, though. You're even talking to me about meeting with a specialist and finding out through your blood and through your what, what's good for you and what's not. Yeah, I realized... That if I was going to keep drinking, that I've got to have a balance. You so met with I a quit. kinesiologist, so well, you could... this is later. So 10 years ago, I quit dairy. And about that time, I quit sugar. Um, and so I started eating healthier. How old do you know? 43. Okay. I started, you know, since I moved to LA, I started juicing more. I just started eating more organic. And cutting out dairy was huge. I recommend it to anybody. It's hard, but... I'm almost it's at zero percent myself. Yeah, it's gross. And sugar, sugar's really hard. But I'll cheat and have like dark chocolate or some things, vegan desserts or gluten free stuff. But then I would drink like a bottle of vodka. So it was like um, this extreme dichotomy. But yeah, so I lined up with a kinesiologist, a holistic doctor that really. Um, Checked my organs and did all this stuff and checked your organs with with, with heat, this heat rays. Yeah, with a heat thing there, he would read the temperature of your organs, what's inflamed, how to alter my diet, what to how to fix that. So inflammation makes your organs hotter. Yeah, and it's just that's when you can find infections and stuff like that if they're working too hard. So anyway, long story short, I just ate healthy and that's probably kept me alive. But I uh, I just decided that you know I was forty three. I had a pretty bad health scare. Uh, this fall and i was like i'm just too old for this shit man. Mm. i mean it, it was fun and i just was like i can't keep doing this would you could we go back uh for a moment to the sandler story of he he sees you uh it, well, he's watching with his wife he sees your stand up he sets a meeting you get a call from your agent saying hey adam sandler wants to meet you yeah what like, does that feel like i was like what why you're a fan of his at this point oh yeah i was a huge fan of that snl group Sandler and Farley and Spade and Phil Hartman, I mean, Kevin Nealon. Yeah. I mean, all those people are Mike Myers. And uh, yeah, I was stoked. But I was kind of like, what? Why? And they're like, he has a movie called Grandma's Boy. I'd already written a movie that got made. So he knew I was a writer. And so he... What movie? Malibu's Most Wanted. Did you wrote that? Yeah, I wrote the original draft for it and got a green light. No shit. Yeah. Were you friends with Jamie Kennedy? Yeah, we became friends on the road. And he goes, I have an idea for a movie. Did you write it with him? Yeah. But I, he goes, I have an idea for a movie. And I'm like, what is it? And he goes, you know that white rapper character I do on stage? I'm like, yeah, it's funny. And he goes, I was thinking about a movie. And I'm like, oh, well, you should have this scene. You should have this scene. And I just rattled off like four scenes off the top of my head that should be in the movie. And he goes, you got to write it. Yeah. And traffic, I go, I don't, I, go I don't know how to write a movie. And he goes, well, get a book. So I bought a book. And uh, I just sat at Jamie's house for like a couple weeks. And he paid me out of his pocket. He's like, I'll give you like five grand. I'm like, all right. So I wrote a rough draft, and we shopped it. It was rated R at the time, and then Warner Brothers, when Jamie had his TV show, Jamie Kennedy Experiment, Warner Brothers was like, we want a movie, and he gave him my script, and they're like, oh, this is insane. They're like, we need someone to dial it down, so they had to, like, somebody PG-13 13 it. Hmm. But so anyway, Sandler hired me to do a rewrite on Grandma's Boy. It was a PG-13 comedy, and he wanted it hard R. And who wrote that? Um, uh, Barry Warnick wrote the original script with Alan Covert. Yeah. And so they brought me on. I love on. Covert, by the way. Yeah, Covert's great. And so they brought me on, and then I just did a page one with Covert, and I just made it insane. So you and Covert put, basically rebuilt it together. Yeah, we rebuilt it. To and, make it R. Yeah, the other like way. hard R. Right. 
and uh, like what you're like yeah yeah so that was and then that was it and then sandler was like oh fuck yeah i want you to do more shit and then so, do my shit so when he wants you to do something does he does he ask you does he say we like what is it do you ever say no to something he's asked you to do i kind of said no to chuck and larry and he was like what do you mean i'm like i've been doing like a lot of gay roles i'm like i just i don't need another one and he was like no this is way different than terry and i just done this indie film i played a gay character and not that I care about playing a gay character, I just didn't want to keep doing it, like anything. It's like if I played a doctor four times in a row, I was like, I don't want to play a fucking doctor again. So he was like, no, it's way different. <laughs> I was like, all right. And then he puts me in like a butterfly up. I was like, <laughs> all right, whatever. And so I did it. And then, uh, but I mean, it's rare that I say no, just because I always trust him. Does he call you? Do you get it from your, does he? Uh, no, does he, he calls me. He says, hey, I have this role. Here's what it is. Yeah. He just is like, hey, I'm doing this movie. You want to do this? And I'm like. What is it? And he's like, it's uh well, he called me one time I just left dinner. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And he goes, Hey, what's up, man? Um, really quick, can you do a German accent? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, Can you just just try it right now? And I'm like, I mean like this, like I'll go to uh, you know, it's a store and uh, you know, whatever, like this. And he goes, Yeah, yeah, it's good. I'll call you back. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? So he called me the next day, he's like, All right, we're doing a movie, you and me and Jennifer Aniston in Hawaii. Um you're playing, uh, I, what, would I, what was I? Was I somebody's brother? Oh, my God. I can't remember. I was. I saw it, too. I, I don't remember what I it was. I can't remember what my character was, but I I played um, somebody's, fuck. <laughs> I can't remember. But I played two characters. So I was this regular dude, and then I played this guy, Dolph, who uh, was a German guy. I played a German dude. Do you guys ever do stand-up together? Yeah, we toured for like two years. Well, how did how did the show go? It was a blast, man. It was what me, was, Sandler, David Spade, and Rob Schneider, and then some shows would have Norm Macdonald and Tim Meadows. What was it? What, what was the lineup? What was the order? Rob would host, and I would do twenty, and then Spade would do twenty, and then Adam would do an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, and Rob would do twenty. Yeah, that's it was a, fun, that's a man. great show. Yeah, it was great. It was a blast. Diarrhea. And um, yeah, it was really fun. I mean, we all know each other so well, so it was pretty funny just being on a plane and. We were getting fights. We would laugh most of the time. You, earlier, you said that you, um, <clears throat> you were given a, 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 a lot of advice when you first started out, and the one that you said was to go to New York first. And then we kind of pushed past that. Were there other there were other specific things that that you got? I'm surprised at how often I get questions on the show when I have people on talking about process. Because everyone's process is going to be different. But how much people enjoy, and I enjoy, hearing like here's basically my rules here are my perspectives on right yeah there's no like br blueprint right to doing it so people want advice like how did how did you do it I'm, my story was such an anomaly nobody can recreate that i mean you can now luckily there's the internet and stuff like that i know bo burnham blew up and he was really young do it you know off youtube and stuff like that so there are but not about how to make it just about well, like make it as subject. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Making it is, but 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 to just to but, but be saying don't go in front of tastemakers too soon is something that everyone could connect to. Um, make sure that you write down your ideas when you have them because inspiration it does you know chooses you. That's that's something like those types of things. Well, the basic building blocks are just right. If you have any ideas, whether it's a show or a movie, just anything, just write and yeah. write. I mean, that's the number one. I mean, whether or not you're in front of people or people who see what. I mean, we live in a day and age now where people can find you on Instagram when Vine was big. But tell me what, what your writing shit. is. You wrote down two sentences and then you performed it for us. When do you do you write more than those two sentences or do you write that on stage? And the only thing you're saying is write, write premises, write premises, write premises for I'm you. Just, I'm saying for me, yeah. I just write anything. I mean, I write... You ever write out paragraphs of a joke? I don't write a paragraph out. I mean, it, it depends upon the joke. If it's a one-liner, I'll write down the one-liner. If it's just a general idea, like in my notes, I just saw when I was reading that joke, um, I'm doing shows in Minnesota, and I was like, oh, I should write a th something about ice fishing. So I just wrote ice fishing, and then I'll go back to that, and you know, I'll sit down before my Minnesota shows and go over all my notes and put together a semblance of a skeleton of an act that will you know hopefully be my special which it will be but 
you know, I'll, I'll just write down what, you know, ice fishing and then try to think of something for it. The beginning of this podcast, I uh, was talking about how you have such an interesting combination of, of broad, big, silly and intensity. And I was thinking, I'm sure there's others that I'm missing, but the only other person I think that shared those things that way are Jim Carrey. And incidentally, you brought up how you were you were influenced by him so much. Right. Jim Carrey is another example of some of of somebody who most people don't know of him because of his stand up, but that is where he started. Did you know his stand up? Were you a fan of his stand up? That was more silly than anything. Well, Jim started off as an impressionist, right? And then he decided to abandon that act, and go kind of darker and deeper and be he just wanted to revamp his whole thing even though he was killing and i thought that was really interesting and i, I would see some of his old clips but i don't think he ever had a special or anything mm -mm. so whatever i can find i always loved finding what he did but i admired that so much that he had a killer routine and was like i'm not happy doing this and reinvented himself i mean that's fucking insane that's what carlin did with his weatherman do you know Carlin's Weatherman stuff? I don't know. I don't think so. He, I was never a Carlin guy. Really? I mean, I always appreciated it, but I, I don't like know his gotcha his comedyography. That's a word. I think it is. Fuck yeah, it is. I mean, it is. Anything else? Another piece of advice I always tell people is just fucking commit. Just commit to something, whether it's a bit, whether it's a role, whether it's whatever you do. Amen. I mean, all the roles I've done that are just insane, and people are like, what the fuck are you doing? And I just commit to it. I mean, my, my role in Bucky Larson, which was panned by critics, and you know, my role on Reno 911, all my roles, I remember I was doing this movie, A Haunted House, with Marlon Wayans, and there was a scene, and Marlon was like, pulls me inside, he goes, hey, man. And I go, what's up? And he goes, I think this scene would be funny if you were naked. And I'm like, like, Naked? And he goes, yeah, just picture how funny that would be. And we have like um, a night cam, so it's through night vision. And you're trying, your character's trying to find me because I'm hitting on him the whole movie. And he goes, what if you're fucking naked? And I'm like, do I have to show my dick? I mean, it's weird. And he's like, no, we can't do that. So, but we'll just, we'll cheat the camera so we just see your ass and all this stuff. And I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, that would make it really funny. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so I was just fucking totally naked. I'm like walking around the set naked and everything. And he goes, hey, man, do you, can you put on a robe? And it was right in between shots. I'm like, no, I'm good. We're about, to, we're about to film. And he goes, no, the robe's not for you. It's just for everybody around you and the crew and everything. Like, Is your dick out during this or you, yeah, you taped up? Yeah, like, you just don't want to watch a naked guy walk around. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so I put a robe on. But I, you know, it's just like with Will Ferrell and all these guys where you just commit fucking to it. I mean, I always love when comics commit to bits. Even if they're not going well, it's even funnier. And you just watch them go in. And commit to it, and it's it's just I always it always is great. Yeah, I have always prioritized that, and I wonder if sometimes it's a defense for like they're not going to like me. Well, let me be in control of that, you know? Right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. I don't think I would have the good versions of what I have as a performer if I didn't have that shield of not caring for whatever reason. I found a way not to care, but. Um, I have noticed as I've gotten older that there are certain bits where it's like I know where I would have done I know what I would have done five seven years ago right but it's just I don't know if I don't have the endurance for it or I just have the instincts to know as funny as I think this is it's not connecting yet it won't connect later but there's something so fun about committing to something so much where even if people don't think it's funny they believe it's real because you believe it's real yeah and there's something so powerful about manipulating the energy in a room the problem is a lot of times, at least from my experiences, it's not funny, but everybody believes it's real and it's so powerful. It's it's one of my favorite things to do and maybe one of the reasons a lot of the clubs say, not for us, but man, committing to something. Yeah, it's a blast. In a movie, I feel it's different because everyone knows why you're doing it. It's way different, but it's funny because I get voted by like the Razzie Awards, which are the anti-Oscars, and for years I would get voted worst actor... I remember one year I was voted worst movie, worst actor, worst supporting actor, worst screenplay. Um, it was like four awards I was nominated for. And I was nominated a lot. I never won. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, you can say I'm not funny. That's fine. But like to say I don't commit and I'm a bad actor, I never agreed with that. You know right. what I mean? Like I, I committed to every role whether you thought I was funny or not. Bucky Larson was voted like worst movie of the year when it came out, like 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. 
I'm like, all right, you don't like it. Well, I think you're an idiot because I think it's hilarious. But you can't say I didn't commit to that fucking character. So right. that was one thing that always kind of subtly rubbed me where I'm like, well, I'm not a bad actor. Why do you think committing is so important to you? I that's mean, a specific, it's, That's a specific priority that not all comedians it's, share. It's important just for the character. It's important for what you do if you half-ass it. I mean, you can say that to anything. Everything you should commit to. Well, the opposite of committing in a performance isn't half-assing it. Jerry Seinfeld wasn't committed to the character. You know, uh, no, but uh, it wasn't a character. Uh, Jimmy I mean, was, Fallon was in, isn't uh, the most committed to his characters, right? But he's likable. It's funny and it works, and that's his thing. But like to commit, well, it depends upon the character. I mean, if you're Jimmy Fallon in the movie Taxi, or you're Daniel Day Lewis in There Will Be Blood, there's a different level of commitment. There's absorbing a fucking character. Which one are you? I'm Daniel Fallon Lewis. DFL. I'm a likable Daniel Day DDL. I just um, think that you've talked about the way you talk about committing and also knowing your performances and your characters. It seems that committing is like that's not that 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 feels learned to me. I mean, I guess you could say that. But it also I don't know. I don't know if it's learned or if it's just you're even proud of saying, they said it's the worst movie. They said it's the worst this. You could think I'm not funny, but do not say I'm not committed. Like, there's like a, an identity to it for you. Right. Well, I'm just proud of what I do, and I'm proud right. of my acting, and I'm proud of my cool. commitment because I put everything into it. So, right. you know, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's learned or whatever, but if it's just experience, and the more I do it, the more, you know, you learn a lot the more you act and the more you do things where you know, your confidence builds up and your commitment builds up. Are you recognized more for a particular role than other things? Or Grandma's people? Boy and Reno 911 are the two. And then, you know, the other ones too, Blades of Glory, all the Sandler stuff, for sure. It depends on the age group. Like, younger kids, like, no, just go with it. They know Grown Ups too. More of the, the digestible Sandler stuff as opposed to, like, the crazy, like, rated R shit. Do you play basketball? Yeah. Yeah, you play with Adam. I played with him. We've played with him for years. Yeah, very he broke aggressive. my hand on a set. Very aggressive, isn't he? He gets really intense, and it's annoying because we'll play when we're filming. That's his big mode of exercise. Uh -huh. He doesn't like gyms and working out, so we'll be like, "Hey, let's go, let's go play hoop. Let's go." I'm like, "Fuck, all right." And um, you can't like hard foul him, or you can't guard him. You're always wary because he's a star, multi mega star. So. If you foul him, if he gets hurt, which he has in the past, I elbowed him in the head once. He had like a knot, and he broke my hand once, and I had to film a scene right after that. My hand was broken, so I, I'm just like, like, can we not play? Can we like play when we're wrapped? Does and he then, get mad at you for doing it, or does he know that's the game? He knows that that's the game, so he'll be like, "Fuck, it's cool, it's cool." And I'm like, "All right, fuck." But I'm like, you wanted to play. <laughs> like, I want to show you. I have a, a lot of awards. You want an Academy Award? No, no, no. But uh, I want you. This is from the uh, basketball comedy league I was in. I have to hold it. I just want you to read the inscription. How small were you? It was a That's different like time. An old joke. Yeah. Best player, worst comic, comedian, basketball league. Yeah. The way you say, like, you could think I'm not funny. You could say this. You could say that. But I'm committed. That's how I feel about me as a basketball player. You That's could say really I'm funny. a bad comic. Who was in this league with you? At the time, there was a lot, a lot of people. It was the comedy basketball league, uh, where there was the comedy store team. There was the improv. Those upright citizens were gay. There was an agents and managers teams. There was other clubs. Jesus, what uh, was this? Our team was the Rick Glassmans. How the fuck did I not get invited? It was like uh, you were probably too successful. It was people oh, that yeah. were on like, Duh. like multi cams that nobody nobody saw. You know what I mean? So it was like working right. people, but nobody knew them. Yeah, I would have played. I love it. I haven't played in a while, but. Do you, do you still play? Um, I do a little bit. I haven't. I used to play a lot in multiple leagues and stuff like that. I'm in a weekly uh, game indoor, never more than 15 people. But my, do you know Bill Lawrence? Yeah, I know Bill. Yeah, yeah, he's my old boss from the TV show that we did together. Right. Um, would you ever come play in that game? I'm really rusty. I would have to. It, there's guys that are like me who are unbelievable, and then it goes to guys who are in their 50s who are comedy writers. Okay. So just so you know the range. Right. So just to be clear. They're, I'm unbelievable, and there's guys that are like, I'm unbelievable, and then there are people that, you know. What is the strongest part of your game? Would you consider yourself... My um, commitment. 
Really? Go that ahead. Ask your question. Circle. Were you, would you consider yourself a shooting guard or a forward? Small forward. Small forward. I was um, going to say that first. Uh, very quick first step. Aggressive could get to the hoop. My ball handling isn't a skill set, but I'm very much in control. Okay. Uh, I could shoot. I'm not a shooter. Um, I just... And also, by the way, I I don't... I've learned in the past few years that, oh, I'm not as good as I thought I was. But that's only because I thought I was the best in the world. Right. So I'm very good. Okay. But I just, I'm just all around. I'm going to score. I'm going to play good defense. I got fun. I get fun like, like when someone pushes me, I get like a cool guy like, all right. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. If I get, if I get a little bit pushed, it's like, yeah, activated. I get activated, bro. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden. Uh, I played once with Adam and we guarded each other and he was giving me little pushes. Yeah. And I gave, I, I'm building this narrative. This isn't real. This is just in my head. You know right. what I'm saying? Yes. And I was, I was like going back at him like that. And I was thinking to myself, excuse me, I knew that he was thinking to himself, this guy really has what it takes. This guy is, you know, <laughs> he's not intimidated. He's pushing me back. He's, he's, he's scoring the ball well. So I figured like when I left that game, I thought, my basketball identity made me allowed Adam to know how good of a comedian and how funny I, you know what I mean? Yeah, I got like that. Like it was that thing. I like that. It's cool. Thanks, man. But would you come play in that game? Yeah, I would. I would play. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask, uh, or you already know him, but I'm going to just. I haven't seen Bill in a while, but I think you'd remember me. Yeah, I mean, Grandma's Boy, Reno 911. I met with him on Scrubs to play Zach Braff's part. Oh, are you auditioned for that? Yeah, and he goes, God, you're really talented. He goes, a lot of comedians aren't really great actors. <laughs> and he goes, you are a, like a legitimate actor. But we're going to give it to Zach Braff. Yeah, we're going to give it to ZB. Understandable, Zach did a great job. If you were to have done that role. I think I was too young, too. I think Zach looked a little bit more mature and older. Do you remember any of the audition scene? No, oh, God, it was so long ago. Well, I have a clip. Do you mind if I cut to it? Ooh. And we're back. I gotta go. Nick, thank you so much for coming on to Take Your Shoes Off podcast. If uh, you want to check out Nick's Instagram, it's... Uh, what's your Instagram? It's at real Nick Swartzen. My website, nickswartzen.net. Twitter, at Nick Swartzen. God bless us all. And I'm excited to hear how your shows at the end of November go. <laughs> One question I forgot to ask you, and this is something I ask all my guests at the beginning. Why not Nick Swartzen? That was taken. You had to add the real... It was uh, stolen. It was hacked. And you couldn't get it back? Um, I, after a while, and then I was just didn't want to deal with it, so I was like, all right, real Nick Swartzen. It's not weird to have... A lot of people have real so-and-so. It so. is weird. And you heard it here first. Nick Swartzen was hacked. It is now at real Nick Swartzen. Thank you so much for tuning in to Take Your Shoes Off podcast, and have a good rest of your week. And then I have the music come in. Oh, Jesus! scoot do blabbity blue scoot Yeah! <laughs>